So this question, why does God allow suffering? And this is probably one of the most common reasons that people give for not embracing the Christian faith, especially in a, in a Western context. And let's just uh, think first of all about the causes of, of suffering that there are, because uh, one great reality of this world is that there, it is full of suffering. We're, we're talking about uh, floods, uh, national disasters, whether they are uh, earthquakes or volcanoes or, or floods or diseases. We're in the middle of a global pandemic now. Uh, infectious disease, blindness, chronic disease, incurable diseases. Um, or we're talking about terrorism or violence from wars or accidents. Uh, but particularly man's inhumanity to man, whether it's it's uh, drugs or alcohol, gambling, prostitution, trafficking, pornography, broken relationships, exploitation, slavery, abortion. There's lots of causes of suffering in the world. And of course, we all at some stage will experience suffering personally, and this might be might be physical suffering. So I've just listed some of the, the symptoms there that are particularly distressing that we all are afraid of, or it could be mental suffering, suffering resulting from the loss. Uh, as the Bible says, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a fountain of life. And the loss of things or people that we greatly uh, dam uh, greatly are attached to, uh, such to our loved ones in our own family, uh, loss of possessions, jobs, skills, a reputation, loss of face, particularly in Eastern cultures, can cause great mental suffering, or mental suffering might become through a mental illness of one of the types listed there, particularly depression or uh, anxiety. So suffering is very much a part of our world and every religion attempts to address it in different ways. And so the approach of, of Islam basically is to say, well, uh, everything is determined by Allah, by God, and suffering is just a fate. God has determined it, who can resist the will of Allah. Or the Hindu idea of karma, that suffering in this life is as, as a consequence of decisions that you've made in a past life. So you're working off the karma of uh, past lives. Or uh, Buddhism, the idea that you escape from suffering because suffering comes from desire. And if you can only extinguish all your desires, then you will not be uh, suffering uh, anymore. Or... Uh, Atheism, the worldview which doesn't acknowledge any spiritual realm, uh, as uh, Richard Dawkins had said, DNA just is, and we dance to its tune. There's no reason or rhyme, it's just chance or random molecule. So uh, it's all fate, it's all retribution, it's just a state of mind, it's just chance. But Christianity can't take refuge in these kind of solutions because we believe in a God who, on the one hand, is omnipotent. In other words, he's all powerful. He can do anything. He's omniscient or all knowing. He knows everything and he's benevolent. He's loving, kind and generous. And so he would surely want to do something. He must know about suffering because he's omniscient. He must be able to do something about it because he's all powerful and he's kind and benevolent. So why? doesn't he? And so this is used as an argument for the non-existence of God, or at, at least that God, if he does exist, is someone you can't trust because of the way that he leaves the world. Now, uh, in, in some ways, suffering, a suffering God, of course, is at the very heart of Christianity. So Jesus is someone who understands suffering because he came to earth as a human being and suffered in the most unimaginable ways through uh, both mentally and physically, through being rejected by his own creatures, but ultimately through being nailed to a cross and suffering a very painful and ignominious death. And uh, Christians have never felt that suffering was a reason not to believe. In fact, they are often believed because of suffering or believe more strongly through suffering. And the philosophical problem of suffering has only been a really a problem since the Enlightenment 
in Western culture of the 18th century, uh, this kind of idea that uh, God is there for us rather than that we are there for, for him. And uh, there are ways that we can answer this, this problem to a certain extent. Now, of course, we can never give a reason for every element and episode of suffering that there is in the world, but there are answers that we can give that make some sense of suffering. And what I want to give you is, is just a scheme for thinking about this that I, I use, and I find it's reasonably easy to remember because you've just got to remember four words in the English language beginning with F, each of which us uh, points to a different reality in terms of answering this question. So let's look at these, these four words. And here they are, uh, the fall, we'll come back to each one of them and unpack them in more detail. Free will, faith, and the future. Fall, free will, faith, and uh, the future. So firstly, suffering is a result of the fall. When God originally created the universe and created human beings, he saw that it was good. There wasn't suffering. There wasn't evil in it. But we live in a fallen world where the rejection of God has led to changes in the world that have led in turn to suffering. And first of all is the fall of angels, which predated the fall of man, uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter three. We read about the fall of angels in Revelation 12, nine. We believe that the, the devil was once a guardian angel who was good, but turned his back upon God and fell into sin and took many other angels with him. And then there's the fall of man. So uh, as illustrated and, and described in the taking of the tree of the knowledge, uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by Adam uh, and Eve. And as a result, the consequences of a breaking of relationships between uh, the, between human beings, between human beings and God, and between human beings and the planet as, as well, so that there's suffering and pain and difficulty that comes into the world. And then we're told that creation itself has fallen. So there were consequences for the whole planet from the rebellion of human beings. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the whole of the universe is groaning as a result of sin. And so suffering is exactly what we'd expect in a fallen world as the consequence of all these broken relationships. And let's just think a little bit more about uh, the devil and his role in all of this, because uh, we believe that there is a spiritual battle going on of which we only see a part. We only see the human elements of it, but there is a battle going on between good and bad angels, between the angels of God and the, the demons of the devil. And that results in a lot of suffering of different kinds. Now, of course, God is absolutely sovereign and in control and nothing happens that he doesn't allow and he will use uh, evil uh, for good. He'll turn it around as Genesis 50, 20 tells us, you intended it for evil, Joseph said to his brothers, but God intended it for good for the saving of many people. And so we see that in the account of the famine in 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21, one of those passages tells us that Satan uh, caused uh, David to take a census, which led to the famine. The other one tells us that God did. Now, which did? Well, well, both are true, but Satan was operating as, as he always does under the sovereign will of God. He can only do what God allows him to do because Satan is like a dog on a leash. He uh, can only work within the boundaries that God uh, gives him. And so in the case of Job, Job has to come and ask for permission to be able to afflict Job. He can only do what God allows him. And the apostle Peter, Satan has to ask Jesus's permission in order to test Peter. And so this is a great encouragement to us is that we know that God is utterly sovereign and that the devil and his angels can only do what God allows them to. And that will all ultimately be for God's glory. So there's our first death, a fallen world that explains why there is so much suffering. Now, our second F is that suffering is a consequence of free will. Now, you've got a picture here of a, 
a robot. And it's a reminder that human beings are not automatons. We're not robots who are programmed to do certain things and make certain decisions. God has given us the ability to make choices. And that ability to make choices involves or includes the choice to do evil as Adam and Eve did when they took the fruit. And in the same way, we can exercise choices for good or for bad. And if we think about the suffering in the world, how much of it is the result either of human beings making active choices or of refusing to make good choices, making bad choices or refusing to make good choices. So on the one hand, there is the sins of commission, the things that we commit. Think of uh, wars or, or famine or alcohol, drugs, violence, accidents, some of the things listed there. But then there's the sins of omission, the things that we could do something about but choose not to. The, uh, how much, the consequences of natural disasters are so much worse when uh, human beings fail to act or they create a situation where there's going to be a lot more damage from, say, an earthquake or a flood because they didn't make the right choices before. So uh, free will, so the fall and free will. The third F is that we've got to see uh, the world through the eyes of faith. In other words, see it from God's perspective and understand what God's greater purpose might be in allowing suffering because he can turn suffering for good. And on the one hand, a little suffering can save a lot of suffering. Now, we would never say that, that Christ's death upon the cross was uh, a little suffering. It was extraordinary suffering, no greater suffering for God himself. But think of the suffering that it saved us, because if that hadn't happened, then all of us would have faced judgment unforgiven, and there would have been no hope for any of us at all. And in the same way, uh, we uh, as human beings can choose to undergo suffering or difficulty. Just think of the, the suffering and difficulty involved in training as a doctor or a dentist and the time and energy that you have to put into that and yet the wonderful fruit of it in being able to help others. And then uh, suffering can rouse us. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great Christian author, said suffering is God's megaphone to a deaf world. If there wasn't suffering, we wouldn't ask the really important questions about the meaning of life. And so they they remind us to ask the questions that are really uh, important. And suffering can also, our own suffering can be a huge motivator, either our own or that in our family, to us be, to become people who uh, are able to uh, help the suffering in others. Suffering can produce endurance. Uh, Romans 5, 3 to 5, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So suffering starts a process by which we mature and grow what's called the pearl effect. So uh, a, a stone or a piece of grit in an oyster can result in a pearl because the suffering or irritation leads to this uh, chemical transformation and create something of great value. And in the same way, human beings through the crucible or difficulty of suffering can be made more mature and, and better people. And God works for good in all suffering for those who love God. In fact, God can use suffering as a discipline to, to harden us, to strengthen us, to build in us uh, character, resilience, endurance, which are going to make us more useful to him and uh, more helpful to others. And as the scriptures tell us, suffering can even be rejoiced in, rejoice in your sufferings, not, not because of your sufferings, but because God is working through them for uh, your, your good. And so we've got to see suffering thirdly through the eyes of faith. It has a purpose. Now, it might not be that we can see that purpose, but nonetheless, God always has a purpose in suffering. And then our final F is to see suffering in the context of the future. Because there will come a day when justice will be done and everything will be put right. Uh, the judgment involves 
putting everything in the world right and transforming the world into a, a beautiful place. Uh, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no suffering or dying or pain where eye has not seen nor ear heard nor mind can see what God has prepared for those who love him. And we will have new bodies as believers because Jesus came, although he came to heal a lot of people, he didn't come to empty the hospitals primarily, but to empty the graveyards uh, so that we might be uh, raised again with new bodies like his resurrected body. And so you can say, well, why doesn't he then uh, come now and do all this? Well, he's delaying because there are many people who have not yet turned from him. And so uh, God does not delay out of vindictiveness, but he delays out of love and mercy in order that others may turn. And this is always a question you can turn around when you're talking to a non-Christian, you know, perhaps one of the reasons that God has not come to end all suffering now is because, um, because you have not yet made a decision and he's patiently giving you time. Now, uh, perhaps more than any other question, we talk about what does this question lead to, but it, more important with this one is what does it lead from? And when you come to answer this question, you've really got to think not just about the question, but about who's asking it and why they are asking the question, because often this question will come out of a deep sense of personal pain or experience. Do they have some personal experience of suffering, uh, perhaps themselves or, or in, their, in their own family where someone they loved has, has suffered? Or are they angry at God or Christians over something? You need to explore this. Uh, or is it just intellectual curiosity? Because for some people, it is just intellectual curiosity. So I think always to ask, you know, that it's a, it's a really tough question, but why, why are you personally asking this question? Why is this a question for you? And so that we're thinking not just about the question for which there are answers in scripture, but uh, also how to address that question to the person that we're, is in front of us. So uh, there you are, uh, the four Fs, that uh, we live in a fallen world, the fall, that God has given human beings and the devil and demons and angels free will, and they exercise that free will. He doesn't intervene to stop every free will choice. That thirdly, we've got to see suffering through the eyes of faith in terms of what God is using it for and what his ultimate purpose is. And then finally, we see it in the context of the future that we, uh, a new world is coming where there will be no suffering. And uh, we see, of course, Jesus who eradicated suffering in others and took suffering upon himself in order that we might be part of that new world. 